Only one city in Colorado hosted an LGBTQ film festival over the course of the first decade of the 2000s, Colorado Springs. The Pikes Peak Lavender Film Festival, beginning in the year 2000, linked the city to an international circuit of festivals and brought a new wave of art into the city. Despite this achievement, and despite recent interest in, Colorado, in the Colorado Springs LGBTQ community, the festival remains an obscure part of our region's history. And one may ask, why hold the festival in Colorado Springs in the first place? Why not Boulder or Denver? But that was the purpose of the festival. Local activists, led by Alma Criminesi, wanted to prove that Colorado Springs could put on such an event. They wanted the festival to reframe Colorado Springs. But reframe it from what? In short, they wanted to win back the city from the memory of Amendment 2, the state initiative that prohibited Colorado from passing protections for gays, lesbians, and bisexuals. That insipid little amendment, as the Colorado Springs Independent once called it, became synonymous with the city, not just in Colorado, but nationally. The US Supreme Court eventually overturned the amendment, but its memory lived on, especially in LGBTQ national media. Criminesi and others preferred that the city be remembered for the vibrant community that predated the amendment. And so she and others launched the Pikes Peak Lavender Film Festival, which would, they hoped, reframe Colorado Springs. Now, Criminesi had been a part of the Colorado Springs LGBTQ community since the 1980s, uh, when the community was far more active and organized than what we probably imagine today. By the mid-1980s, the community had its own gay and lesbian community center, which hosted a 24-hour helpline. The center's newsletter, Gay Speak, advertised film screenings. And this is a, uh, uh, one of the calendars from the uh, magazine. It advertised film screenings, church meetings, support groups, including Gay Alcoholics Anonymous and women's empowerment groups. The hide-and-seek gay bar on Colorado Avenue had served the community since 1969. The local community stayed involved in statewide initiatives through the Imperial Court of the Rocky Mountain Empire, a nobility-themed grassroots organization, as well as through its participation in Denver's annual Pride Parade. Uh, there was no concern that Colorado Springs might turn on the community at the time. Alma Cremonesi, in an essay written for Gay Speak in 1985, argued that lesbians in Colorado Springs could, quote, count ourselves among the luckiest women in the world, free from the oppression of cultures that forced women to, quote, produce as many children as possible. The only real challenge she saw was the looming presence of the military, which was openly hostile to gays and lesbians during those years. She expressed no fears about an anti-LGBTQ activity coming from within the city itself. In 1991, uh, the year before Amendment 2, the Colorado Springs LGBTQ community looked like it would break into the mainstream. The first Pride Parade was held in 1991. Inside Out Youth Services, an organization still known for its work with LGBTQ youth, was formed within the county health department. And in 1991, the city council floated the idea of including sexuality in non-discrimination ordinances. Gay Speak told the readers, quote, yes, it might just be possible, and celebrated at the end of 1991 that, quote, things are changing in Colorado Springs. Things did change for the LGBTQ community in Colorado Springs, but not in the way that Gay Speak had hoped. It began when a group of local activists, eventually led by car dealer Will Perkins, successfully defeated the proposed protections for gays and lesbians in Colorado Springs. Under the name Colorado for Family Values, the group then set its sights on banning such protections across the state. They launched a ballot initiative in 1992 to amend the state constitution to prohibit cities, quote, from adopting or enforcing any law or policy that recognized homosexuality as a protected class. This initiative became known as Amendment 2, which was just a reference to its placement on the ballot that year. Colorado for Family Values presented Amendment 2 as a fight for Colorado's soul. A widely distributed pamphlet, which we can see here, called on voters to, quote, join in combating the very grave threat of militant homosexual activists who have, quote, launched an aggressive statewide campaign to give our state's legal blessing to their aberrant homosexual behaviors and lifestyles. The measure won by 50,000 votes here in Colorado Springs, wiping out Denver's 40,000 vote margin against it and allowing the rest of the state to easily carry Amendment 2 to victory. Amendment 2 set off a firestorm of activity that brought Colorado and Colorado Springs into the national spotlight. 
Boycott Colorado, a protest group founded in New York City, successfully organized a national boycott against Colorado and its products. The organization famously held a Colorado Tea Party in May of 1993 when they dumped Coors Light and other Colorado products into the Hudson Bay. <laughs> Local activism proved just as energetic. Organizations including the Gill Foundation, Citizens Project, the Colorado Springs Independent all emerged in response to Amendment 2. A protest group aptly named Ground Zero formed in the weeks after Amendment 2 and quickly became the face of the boycott in Colorado Springs. Ground Zero secured the front spot in the annual LGBTQ march on Washington, D.C., cementing Colorado Springs' role as a center of LGBTQ resistance. It was, as one local activist called it, the, quote, golden era of LGBTQ activity in Colorado Springs. In May of 1996, the Supreme Court declared Amendment 2 unconstitutional. In reality, the amendment had been caught up in the courts since inception and had never been in effect. Still, the national boycott and the Supreme Court decision had a lasting impact on perceptions of Colorado Springs. Moreover, Colorado for Family Values remain active, and their attempts to push similar initiatives in other states made them familiar names in LGBTQ literature across the nation. Colorado Springs was, for anyone involved in LGBTQ activism in the 1990s, the quote, hate city. Uh, and while some activists viewed this reputation as a rallying point, others, including Alma Cremonesi, saw it as a problem the local community should fix. The moniker hate city, Cremonesi believed, could damage the city's economy and erode the longstanding LGBTQ community. Quote, the town had a horrible reputation in the gay community, Cremonesi later remembered, and quote, we wanted to do something about that. And so Cremonesi and others began work on a film festival that they believed would help rehabilitate Colorado Springs. The product of their work, the Lavender Film Festival, lasted 12 years. Uh, they held the festival at the Fine Arts Center for eight years before moving to Colorado College for its final four. Funded in part by the Gill Foundation, the same organization that funded LGBTQ activism during the Amendment 2 days, the festival operated as an unofficial subsidiary of the San Francisco Festival, from which organized picked films for the Colorado Springs event. The three-day event included opening and closing ceremonies, and the organizers commissioned local artwork, uh, which we a lot, a lot of it will see here, uh, for its posters and programs. After one false start, the festival organizers had originally planned to open in Kimball Theater in, the, in 1999. The Pikes Peak Lavender Film Festival premiered in September of 2020 at the Fine Arts Center in downtown Colorado Springs. The first year was filled with promise. The Colorado Springs Independent, which I should note was one of the event's benefactors, declared that there was, quote, no doubt that the city found itself in, quote, the midst of a cultural transformation, perhaps even a revolution. And of course, quote, it may have all begun with Amendment 2. All hyperbole aside, the first year of the festival proved a success. Between grants, sponsorships, and ticket sales, it drew in enough money to leave festival organizi organizers with no doubt about whether there would be another. The Pikes Peak Lavender Film Festival reached a new height in its second year. A, com a combination of controversy and a hit film with local connections propelled the festival into cultural relevance. The controversy centered around a suggestive poster, which mixed images of human anatomy in a style that challenged gender norms. The Denver Post ran an article on the poster, which Cremonesi herself had hung in shops around the city. She says later, quote, I thought it was a very clever poster, the male and female and everyone kind of thing. Uh, we hung a lot of posters in Denver, and there was no problem there. But in Colorado Springs, Cremonesi noted, many places wouldn't hang it. The headline film, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, garnered local attention as it starred a former resident of Colorado Springs, John Cameron Mitchell. Mitchell had lived briefly in the city in his youth, and his parents had since returned to the city to retire. A Gazette interview with Mitchell's father, also named John, contained a few notable moments. John explained that while his son Mitchell was a, quote, homosexual, he was not gay. An important distinction for Mitchell's father, who did not want people to think that his son, quote, flaunted his sexuality. The assertion may seem absurd today, but the article took a step in the direction the organizers of the festival had hoped. It steered conversation towards the existence of LGBTQ people living in Colorado Springs. Despite the increased interest from the media, problems began mounting for the festival in its third year. Everything went up in price, Criminosi later complained. A couple of the festival's early sponsors pulled out that year. 
The festival had to fire its proje projectionist after Criminosi claimed he would, quote, close his eyes and pray after starting each film for fear that God was going to strike him down. And on top of these financial problems, one of the festival's organizers, radio show host Jocelyn Sandberg, was murdered by an unknown assailant months before the festival began. The Denver Post locked onto the festival's financial struggles, and they said, quote, part of the story is a tale of two cities. While the festival would probably score a slam dunk in Denver's well-educated, culturally connected gay community, it has always been a long shot in notoriously conservative Colorado Springs. A series of local political events exacerbated the festival's problems and pushed its organizers further from their goal. The city council voted in late 2002 to extend city employee benefits to gay couples, only to overturn that decision four months later after the April elections. Then, newly elected Mayor Lionel Rivera extended official recognition to the annual Colorado Springs Pride Festival, only to rescind that recognition the next year. At a town hall held at the Gay and Lesbian Fund for Colorado's headquarters, Rivera defended his reversal by arguing that while, quote, some city residents have told uh, me that Colorado Springs has a nationwide reputation for intolerance, he had, quote, heard a different story in his travels around the nation. What you hear and what I hear are entirely different, interjected Criminesi, who was in attendance. Uh, national coverage of Colorado Springs also frustrated the group's efforts. Christian organizations opposed to same-sex marriage like Focus on the Family and New Life Church dominated LGBTQ perceptions of the city, especially after founder of New Life Church Ted Haggard was accused of having an extramarital affair with a male sex worker. Still, still festival organizers stayed focused on rehabilitating Colorado Springs in the community. Criminosi argued that the festival was now, quote, a counter to Focus on, on the Family. These, organiz excuse me, these organizations dominated the news, but it was, quote, important that Colorado Springs isn't presented as a monolith to the world, she explained. The world should know that the city, quote, has gays and lesbians living here too. In the end, it was not the external pressures that brought down the festival, but internal conflict on the board. Arguments about everything from money to film selection to festival themes abounded. After a grant proposal failed to bring in as much money from the Gill Foundation as it had in the past, the board blamed Criminesi for not making it a priority. Criminesi countered that the former grant writer was simply unavailable and that in reality, it was the rest of the board's inability to secure any sponsorships whatsoever that was the real problem. If you and the festival continue to behave in this fascistic way towards me, she wrote in an email, I will not continue. She added, it has been incredibly difficult to keep the festival alive this long. I beg, please at least be fair. The turning point for the festival came in 2008 when it moved from the Fine Arts Center to Colorado College as the center initially went through renovations, although it turned out to be a permanent move. Criminesi later remembered that the community preferred the luxury of the Fine Arts Center and projection problems diminished interest in the new venue. Internal documents show revenue fell from $33,000 in its last year at the Fine Arts Center to $23,000 in its second year at the college. In 2011, the Gazette's art section called for rough weather ahead for the Film Fest, as we see here. Cremonesi told the Gazette that year, if the festival did not break out, uh, organizers would, quote, need to have a discussion about doing it at all. And indeed, Cremonesi decided to end the festival after 2011, although she began working with the Rocky Mountain Women's Film Festival to ensure that select films from the San Francisco Festival were still shown in Colorado Springs, and that's true to this day. In the Lavender Film's heyday, Criminesi published an open letter asking if, quote, our GLBT sisters and brothers in Denver would finally forgive Colorado Springs for Amendment 2. After all, Criminesi argued, we are, quote, the only city in Colorado to host a GLBT film festival. And what an ambitious goal that was, to organize the state's first sustained LGBTQ film festival in a city famous for its opposition to the community. Did this effort change perceptions of the city? Probably not. Amendment 2 continues to loom over the Colorado Springs LGBTQ community to this day. But today, we get to decide how we remember the Pikes Peak Lavender Film Festival. And maybe we should remember it for what it was, proof that the LGBTQ community will always exist in Colorado Springs.
Thank you.